Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to Policy and Practices' latest webinar. And um, today we're going to be talking about the emerging demand on council tax support schemes uh, and also the hardship fund, uh, looking at uh, and looking at vulnerability and how that can be tackled. Um, so, is your post-COVID-19 council tax support scheme sustainable? Uh, it's great to see so many people here on the webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, while we all get settled in, um, I know most of people will be very familiar with this, but if I could just do some housekeeping, um, let me know that you can hear me via the audio chat by raising your digital hand in the panel on your right hand side. And that's also where you ask questions. So please do so throughout the webinar and we will have time at the end to get to them. Um, no question too hard today. Uh, we will have a couple of polls uh, throughout the webinar and also a survey at the end. So do please stick around for that. Uh, there's lots of really good stuff in that survey um, that you can uh, ask for information on. We will aim to have you on your way by 11.30. Now, we, we have, uh, if we go over because of the Q&As, if we get lots and lots of questions, um, please do stick around, um, but appreciate if you can't, but that, those are our timings today. Um, the slides and this recording will automatically follow, um, so don't worry about taking uh, notes. Um, and also we're live tweeting today, so do follow, follow us. Um, at policy underscore practice and use the hashtag helpful policy um, as well. Great, thank you very much. Lovely, thank you for uh, raising your hand. It's great to know that you can hear me. Um, so let me introduce you please to today's speakers uh, and all policy and practice panel today. I'm delighted to introduce to you my colleague Zoe Charlesworth, Head of Policy at Policy and Practice. Zoe, would you like to say hello? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Zoe. My colleague, Megan McLean, Senior Analyst at Policy and Practice. Megan, would you like to say hello? Morning, everyone. Lovely, Megan. And also Devon Galani, Director and Founder at Policy and Practice. Would you like to say hello, Devon? Devon will say hello shortly, no doubt. Um, let's move on then. Um, just quickly before I hand over to, I'll, I'll do our first poll and hand over to Zoe. Um, just for those of you who are maybe new to our webinars uh, and maybe don't know enough about policy and practice, never heard of us before, we exist as an organisation um, to give this the best support, uh, to help you to give the best support you can to help people on their way. Um, so so that's, that's what we do. And we do this by, as you can see there on the right hand side, we have three ways of doing this. But we do it by analysing the impact of welfare policy. And that's really going to be what a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, and we've developed our award winning benefits calculator software um, to help frontline organisations to dissolve the complexities of the welfare system. Um, a heady ambition, I'm sure. While our data analytics dashboard, um, which we'll be touching on today as well, helps local authorities to identify vulnerability target support and track change very important in these times i'm sure that you will agree um, today's agenda i mentioned there that we're going to be talking about um, the the uh, council tax support so we're also looking at how the hardship fund and council tax reduction schemes interact and so is going to be giving us a lot of insights um, in, into that we'll also be talking about what the future looks like uh, and how you could be uh, planning for future vul vulnerability um, how you can identify the most, the most vulnerable households in your area so that you can target your, your additional support to them. Uh, and Megan is going to be talking to us specifically about um, council tax support modelling um, that we've done uh, for, for local authorities. Uh, and Devon's going to be talking to us about that, that point about uh, identifying and targeting support. Um, so hopefully a packed agenda and nice and pacey uh, today as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, the first things first, let me get our first poll on the way and ask you all um, this particular question. On your screen, hopefully, you will be able to see um, a question asking you, um, do you think that the hardship fund will cover your additional CTR claims, council tax reduction claims? Um, the answers for you to choose from, no, I know it definitely won't cover uh, additional claims. Um, I doubt it, and I think it probably won't cover additional claims. Uh, maybe, I think it might cover additional claims. And yes, I know it definitely will cover additional claims. And of course, uh, the catch-all, I don't know. Um, very interested to hear uh, everybody's views on this because it's an area that we have spent uh, the, the last few weeks since the hardship fund, I suppose, was announced. We've been really analysing this internally. Uh, and I suppose Zoe's going to talk us through uh, our, our own take on that. So very interested to hear 
what you think. Um, okay, I think we will leave it there. I think most people have voted. Um, thank you very much. Let me close that poll and share it on the screen. And hopefully you can see some results there. Um, Zoe, if you can see them on the screen, would you like to comment on those findings? Um, let me know if you can't see them. No, I can see them, Janet. Um, and I think the findings are, are really spread around, aren't they? Um, it might do, it might not. And actually, councils are absolutely right. Um, it's the difference between how much you've got left over. We'll come on to later how that 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 that's worked out between various different councils. Some councils, there'll be nothing left. I mean, in fact, the addition, expected additional claims is going to cost them quite a bit. For others, there'll be a, a large amount left. Um, some councils will have done some internal analysis, some general analysis, but um, data analysis would let, does let councils know um, exactly how much they were likely to have left. But of course, all predictions at this stage on how many additional claims they are, they're pretty wide, the lower and upper bounds. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised by these at all, Janet. Excellent. So, yeah, and I'm sure, I know you're going to come on to that shortly in a moment. Devon, before we move over to Zoe, do you have anything to respond to on the results of this poll? Yes. Um, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes, uh, I, was muted clear. I was muted earlier because my daughter insisted that I give her a cuddle because she'd hurt herself. Um, so that's, that's what happened uh, uh, during the introduction. I think these results actually kind of probably reasonably accurately reflect how different councils are feeling. Um, about this and that's because as Zoe said you know the spread of some councils having a fair amount left over and some councils having very little left over if anything at all um, is is something that we're about to talk about on this webinar so it's, it's probably there's a decent chance that those um, polling have a, have a decent sense of, of how their local council is able to respond. Brilliant thanks Devon. Let me hide this poll and then uh, hand over directly to you Zoe over to you thank you. Ah, thanks ever so much, Janet. Um, hi, everybody. So, yeah, the areas I'm going to talk about um, today are the economic fallouts from COVID-19. I mean, we've we've heard an awful lot about this. Um, most people will have, have certainly if you're from Reds and Bev Benefits backgrounds, or you're from um, housing associations, CABs, other groups that are um, helping support people about the impact on households uh, and expected trajectory of that. But of course, council tax support, because it sits outside universal credit, is often left out of all this. But it has a direct impact on council finances um, and how much councils are able to support people. So let's have a look at that. The Hardship Fund, a government response to um, the, the pressures that are going to be on councils, will have different impacts uh, geographically. Uh, the poll shows that, but we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Then look at how all this comes together and the impact on. Uh, collection and pressures on council finances and then how to support people how do we support people when councils have um, uh, limited funding and that's really going to be taken forward by Megan and Devon so I won't be touching on that much but let's move on to the first slide like this is just a bit of a background to the economic fallout um, the OBR forecast and there are a couple of forecasts but this is sort of down the middle um, looks at unemployment peaking at 2.5 million in 2020 um, and carrying on till next year. So unemployment is still expected to be high next year. That's an increase in, of 92% um, <laughs> throughout this year on average and still at 80% increase by next year. At the same time, we're expecting earnings to reduce and inflation to only slightly, but to increase until 2024. And unemployment is predicted to be high until 2024. All this is that the OBR, we know that their forecasts are very good. We know that they, they do these very, very well. But in, in nobody, this is unprecedented. Nobody's seen um, this type of economic fallout before. So these are very sort of broad figures. But what it does show us is there's going to be um, a large, um, first of all, it shows that this is going to be a long term. Uh, effect. Um, and we also don't know what's going to happen with the end of the COVID-19 protection measures, the coronavirus job retention scheme and the self-employed um, income support scheme. I'm expecting that once employers have to start making contributions from July onwards, 
we're going to um, we're going to start seeing some of those people who've been protected by those schemes moving over to means tested benefits. Some won't, some may go back into employment, but some will certainly move over um, to means tested benefits. So we, we're, we're sort of e um, leveled off in unemployment, um, but I'm thinking from July, August, September, October, we're going to have a steady rise <coughs> as employers have to put in more and more of um, their own funding to meet the cost of those schemes. There will also be a huge impact on poverty uh, from, a, from a household point of view. Analysis from policy and practice shows that one in five, and this is pre-COVID, couldn't meet basic household bills. Uh, you've got to remember that um, the benefit system, means-tested benefits, still contain austerity measures from the previous um, uh, uh, economic downturn. So, um, and this uplift that was announced for universal credit the DWP are quite, um, they've been quite insistent this is only going to last for a year. So although that has cancelled out the uh, freezing benefits, it's only for one year and next year people's, the, the means tested benefits are likely to go down. So for households, we're expecting to see an increase in the number of households who can't meet bills who are in poverty. Obviously, in the end, this has an impact on collection rates. <coughs> Already in the last three months, councils have lost 470 million in business rates, 506 million in council tax payments, and half a billion from their collection funds. I mean, this is huge. This is absolutely huge. Um, and although this is just looking at the collection fund, this is in addition to income loss in councils um, due to uh, other revenue um, deductions and investment returns. And the investment returns seems to be making the biggest difference. Um, the investment choices seems to be making the diff biggest difference between council finances. In response to um, the expected rise in poverty, the um, government uh, gave councils £500 million pounds between to support low income residents through the hardship fund. Um, the, uh, the, was, this came with very clear guidance on how it's to be used of £150 pound a year for all households in uh, receipt of council tax reduction, and any remainder could be used for new claims and discretionary support. We do know that most councils did apply it like this. Some didn't. Some gave more than £150 if they th thought they were going to have a lot left. Others have given less and have moved it to where they feel the biggest impact on council finances are going to be, for example, to target homelessness. The, um, and, and the, the, the difference between councils also reflects the amount they're going to have left over. If you consider the, the great variety of council tax reduction schemes out there, some local authorities um, have a maximum ward of 100% of liability, still quite a, a number out there. And actually, pre-COVID, one of the trends we were seeing was more and more councils were moving back to 100% because of the impact on collection rates, <coughs> which we will come to a bit later. But we, we were seeing a trend back towards more generous schemes. But there were councils out there where their maximum support is 60%. So even for people on the means tested benefits, we're expected to pay 40% of their council tax charge. And I think it's always worth remembering that when these levels of benefits were set in the way back in the past and were then uprated with inflation each year until the benefit freeze, there was no expectation that. Um, households who weren't working would pay anything towards the council tax. It wasn't built into that level of benefit support. So um, that was, a, a, some councils asking um, residents to pay 40% is actually quite, you know, that that's tricky anyway. But when you've got hardship funds of 150 pounds a year, if, if a council was paying, um, giving a council tax reduction scheme of 100% of li liability, there weren't many of their residents left with 150 pounds on their bills. So they had an awful lot of that hardship fund left over. In fact, the only ones they would be um, giving this award to are those with non-dependents or who are working. On the other hand, those with less generous schemes would be having to give this £150 to every single one of their residents, leaving them very, very little left over. And this is um, some analysis we did. Now, this was using national averages. So if these councils beginning with A, sorry, you're at the top of the list, if you're you're joined us, um, yeah, these were using national figures, so we used national predictions of unemployment, 
um, which we'll come on to in a minute, this, this first slide doesn't show unemployment, but we showed national averages of numbers of non-dependents and things like this. But we did use your own council tax schemes. Um, and we can see that the proportion of hardship um, fund remaining Greater is 78, well, 78% 78 after they've given £150 to everybody who was in their caseload in 2019-20. But Amber Valley only has 38% left over. And Ashford only has 31% left over. So this is the figures we've got on the far right column here is the amount of the funding from the government that's left over if £150 was given to every single person who was in the caseload that was used to calculate the hardship fund allocations. So basically your 2019-20 caseload. Thanks, Janet. If we then add to this, this is basically the same table, but we've on the right, we've added two more columns. We've uh, increased the £150 um, payments to the expected uh, new unemployment, unemployed who will be claiming council tax support. So um, we can see in Ada, for example, that even after a 92% um, benefit rise, 92% caseload rise, we can see they've still got 58% of their hardship fund remaining. But Amber Valley and Ashford are both, well, they, if they continue paying that £150 to all new claimants, will find themselves in deficit um, at the end of the financial year. And I think it's really important for councils to know <laughs> which of these categories they're um, going to fit into because if if you're going to be in deficit you're going to have to work out actually who you're going to give additional funding to so Amber Valley and Ashford obviously can't afford to give that 150 pounds to every new claimant they're going to have to start targeting that just to ensure that they don't go into deficit whereas you've got if you look at Allerdale and Ashfield on here they will have some left over and then again targeting comes into it that can be used for discretionary support, but who do you give that discretionary support to? Who's most in need in the borough? So I think that what this really highlights is that knowing the impact locally is really vitally important. <coughs> I'd just like to say that, that that table is on our website. So if you're from the CAB or a housing association who've joined us today, you're not from a local authority, um, but you want to sort of know um, whether your own local authority is likely to have any hardship funding left over so that you can um, point your um, your customers in the right direction. Go and have a look at that table. We won't we won't be 100 on because we're not looking the, at the individual data, but it will give you an idea of whether there's any additional funding locally. For the councils, obviously, this is this tensions um, between the cost to the council um, and increasing. Uh, and the increased need to support um, households in crisis, in poverty, is huge. Um, councils have got reduced uh, income, but there are more people needing their support. And this is really tough for councils, isn't it? I mean, it's not, uh, if we go back to that first slide and we look at the economic fallout, we're not talking about just this year, we're talking next year and the year after. Um, and, and councils will need to make a balance between between these two. And I think the, the different councils are going to come down um, on different sides. So move on because to the next slide, Janet, because actually this does have an impact on collection rates. So we've still got the issue where in your collection rates, so your, your key PFI. Um, and so there's always this pressure to increase in your collection. Uh, and this is alongside the numbers who are unable to pay um, increases. So there, there has to be some some move in that PFI to include um, ongoing years so that payments can be spread. There's also a, a need to focus on customer focused collection practices. Uh, there is no point trying to get money from people who, who don't who, who can't pay as we said earlier when these benefit rates were set out they they weren't expecting to pay they, they weren't they weren't designed to include council tax um uh payments as well as ongoing living costs um and we've just done some we've done some recent research which actually might help focus the mind on this for the um 
Greater London Authority. And we were looking at, and this was, although it was based on London, it was, um, it used national data to look at if those councils that had more customer focused um, policies were actually seeing a drop in collection. And we found none. There was no correlation between those who use more hev um, heavier enforcement methods and those who didn't. So the, C the collection rates, there were two things that were correlated with collection rates. One was the CTR scheme, as one would expect, if you're expecting people to pay half their liability when they on means tested benefits, you're not going to collect as much as um, somewhere that gives 100, you know, 100% it's covered. Um, but the other thing was poverty in the area. So the two things that were actually um, correlated with collection rates with the CTR scheme and poverty, and actually the CTR, C, the council tax charge and the um, level of enforcement activity were not correlated with collection rates. So I think that this idea that um, to look at collection practices um, and be wary of being more customer focused because it might have an impact on that QPFI doesn't necessarily hold firm. Thanks, Janet. <coughs> Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Zoe. A huge amount of detail and lots of very interesting facts there. So do get your questions into the panel on the right hand side. Um, and so we will have time to answer them later on. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Megan um, to take us through some council tax modelling that we've done. Over to you, Megan. Hi, Megan. Can you hear us OK? OK, no doubt there's a uh, an audio uh, thing going on. Let me see if I can help at all. Um, Megan, hi, I can't hear you. Um, Zoe, I don't suppose you can hear Megan, can you? No, I can't. Um, do you want me to just work, work through Megan's slides until Megan comes back on? Yes, please. Megan, if you want to dial out and then dial back in again, um, thank you, Zoe. If you would pick up while Meg Megan does that, um, all the best laid prep uh, and practice. Um, thanks, Zoe, if you wouldn't mind. And no problem at all. Um, so what we're going to focus on now is um, how council tax scheme modelling can help local authorities sort of overcome, address this tension between cost um, and need in the local area. We know that, uh, so we'll stop what was happening pre-COVID. 90% um, of English councils had made changes to the scheme. And initially, most of these were cuts. So as pressure was uh, mounting on local authority finances, we know that local authority finances were being steadily cut as it came, even pre-COVID. Um, they were asking, um, they were reducing their council tax support schemes. Uh, but a quarter of that additional liability was not collected. If we look at those who fall into arrears, it was mostly lone parents, um, single people and renters. What's interesting, though, is where schemes um, supported the vulnerable, it wasn't the group who were most likely to fall into arrears. Thanks, Janet. Great, thanks, Zoe. OK, looking now at options for targeting support, Zoe. So yeah, I, what we've done work, did work with loads of councils to look at the various options they have for targeting support. And some councils were trying to marry this up with their arrears figures. Others had overarching um, council objectives that needed to come into their schemes. Um, and one of the most popular uh, options that people were looking at is income banded schemes. And this was mostly to ensure that um, a lot of the cost of council tax didn't go into administration. Once council tax was um, disaggregated from, council tax support was disaggregated from housing benefit, the old scheme with its complex regulations could le lead to about a um, quarter of the cost going into administration. Income banded much easier to administer and it did sort of dampen down that need for reassessment each month in, in response to UC changes. So um, just an example of an income banded scheme here. Move on, Janet. And that was very pop, that's been coming more and more popular. Other people have been making small tweaks to their scheme. Um, Sorry, can you? Oh, Megan, can you you're back. I need you to carry on. Okay, thanks. thanks. Sorry, Sorry everyone. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as Zoe was picking up, there are some small tweaks available to local authorities who are hoping to lower their costs through their scheme. 
So the initial three bullet points that we've got here are um, they're covering costs and um, a way to lower costs through um, lowering support. So by changing the maximum support against liability or introducing minimum income floor for the self-employed. Whereas the bottom two bullet points are covering means to lower administrative costs. And um, these include flat rate non-dependent deduction um, rather than the current banded and non-dependent deduction. Uh, alternatively, local authorities can introduce the minimus rule whereby there's... Sorry, I've just been told there's an echo. Yeah, there's Megan, maybe just need to meet your... Either just mute your phone or your laptop, um, or turn the microphone off your phone or, or laptop. And is that better now? Yeah, sound great. Thanks, Megan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so de minimis rules uh, cover off um, where a local authority can introduce thresholds for income fluctuations. Uh, this might be a particularly uh, important introduction um, in the coming months as we would expect earnings to fluctuate quite a lot in the current economic uncertainty and um, so this would uh, really lower local authorities um, administrative costs by ensuring if um, a claimant increases their um, earnings by perhaps 50 pounds from one month to the next um, they, the local authority would not have to um, reassess their claim and that's especially important um, among universal credit claimants. So uh, kind of moving forward, this could be quite a popular move. And so if we move on, Janet, to the next. Um, on the other side of the tension, um, as Zoe had stated previously, we're seeing um, an increase in groups who are financially vulnerable due to um, the ongoing economic fallout. So local authorities, while cutting costs um, in some measures of their scheme changes, could introduce protections for those they deem vulnerable um, through uh, increased maximum support um, or lowering the taper or introducing um, an additional band within an income banded scheme for uh, key groups. So some of the popular groups that we see um, local authorities introducing protections for are those in receipt of disability benefits, uh, lone parents with younger children, those with um, a, the limited capability for work-related activities, so those too sick to um, enter the work um, place, and carers. Uh, protection is typically based on 100% of liability, meaning that um, if there's a lower uh, liability, uh, sorry, if there's a lower maximum support for other groups, um, we're distributing that away from um, groups deemed to be vulnerable. Um, and again, this could be introduced in an income banded scheme or through the default scheme. Um, one new group that we see as emerging is particularly vulnerable through the data analysis that we do is actually young single households with no dependents because the benefit system is so um, it's kind of geared towards protecting those who have dependents or who are um, within one of these um, kind of initial groups that we've listed in the top bullet points um, actually we see young households who perhaps have less support in other areas of the uh, benefit system showing up in arrears within council tax. So we've seen some local authorities moving to support such households but um, it may be especially important in the coming months to kind of reconsider who we deem to be vulnerable and um, data analysis is especially important in um, the role of redesigning this. Um, so if we move on, Janet, again. So covering off how data analysis can help to design the best scheme for your local authority, um, just briefly, the um, data that we bring is on the household level. So this allows um, local authorities that we work with to fully understand the impacts of any changes that they would um, consider bringing in, um, how that affects individual households, and indeed you can then aggregate that according to which groups are of most interest to the council. 
So we're really always taking into consideration the members' um, questions and um, key objectives, as with um, those of um, the Revs and Bens teams, and um, kind of bringing light to that through the data that we um, uh, present will um, um, inform final scheme design and um, we have regularly fed into public consultation to um, highlight who would lose and gain in any um, change. The power of the modelling that we do really lies in the, um, we've got a really powerful policy engine uh, that sits at the back of our software and this allows us to model the current um, benefit system and future changes that we expect to see in benefit rates in inflation and in wages and what this allows us to do is to predict what would be the impact of retaining your current scheme in the changing wider context and this allows for us to predict the um, true meaning of um, changes that are being considered by the council in the future so we um, kind of remove outside co um, contextual factors from this and this is especially important in the COVID, the post-COVID um, world because we can start looking at things like changing caseloads uh, by looking at the data and um, we would expect that to be especially important as um, we've obviously seen um, increasing caseloads in the um, previous months. Um, and the final two points are the modelling really allows us to look at who is particularly vulnerable within the demographics of the local authority and to target the support to them, um, which would allow for greater protection um, of the residents themselves and of the collection rates of the local authority. So if we move on again, Janet. Uh, so this is just um, providing some of the um, kind of key areas that we bring out in our modelling. So we will always look at the cost of any given model to the local authority, both um, in terms of support provided and we'll also predict the changes in administrative costs. Uh, we'll also look at the um, impact of the cohort size and who would lose eligibility and then looking down towards the political and social impact. Um, of who would be losing support and um, how this would be distributed. Um, we kind of drilled down in our reports to look at key groups and on the individual household level. Um, so kind of bringing out any predictions so that any local authority um, considering changes knows exactly how that would impact their um, cohort as a whole rather than um, otherwise going in and perhaps having unintended consequences. And if we can move on, Janet. So the key considerations um, in redesigning a scheme are the demographics of the local authority, which we can bring out in the data. The current scheme uh, provides the benchmark of um, that will define how much room the local authority will have to play around with increasing or decreasing support um, and how to target um, those identified as being um, of particular interest to the council. Um, we'll also be taking into consideration members' objectives and local priorities, as well as the economic impact of the pandemic in the area, um, which we can see by tracking um, the uh, data over time. So uh, all this is to say that with the current um, economic impacts of uh, COVID-19, the schemes um, currently in place are likely to not be fit for purpose in April 2021. So most local authorities will probably need to look at changing um, some elements of their scheme, whether to um, reduce costs overall um, and perhaps to protect uh, vulnerable households. And we're just trying to reiterate the importance of looking at the data before um, making any changes so that we again are not um, kind of bringing out any unintended consequences around um, those claiming. So that's, that's me. Thanks, Janet.
Great. Thanks ever so much, Megan. A huge amount of detail um, gone through at pace there. So if there's anything that you would like uh, to ask or anything you'd like uh, Megan to explain further, um, please just do pop your question into the panel. Um, but while we do that, before I move over to Devon, our last speaker, what I'd like to do is just ask you this poll. Uh, it's going to be a great uh, uh, bridge, I suppose, into uh, what Devon's going to talk about. So hopefully what you will see on your screen um, is a, our second poll saying, uh, what actions are you actively considering right now um, to tackle the impact of the COVID-19 fallout, which as we've heard from our speakers um, is going to be quite significant. Um, so the options, uh, and I think for this particular poll, you can choose as many as you like. Um, so the options that we've got here on the screen are uh, that you're going to be reviewing your current council tax reduction scheme. You're already planning to do that. Uh, secondly, you're going to ensure your residents are claiming all the benefits to which they are eligible. That's what to say. Uh, thirdly, you will be identifying the most vulnerable households early. Uh, fourthly, you will be tracking unemployment uh, and getting employment support to people early. Um, and finally, and there's there's uh, uh, there's no judgment on this one, and you really uh, don't know yet. Uh, you're waiting to see uh, what's going to happen. Um, great, thank you very much. A lot of a lot of choices there, quite difficult, um, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's lots of don't knows yet. Um, but it's great to see the answers coming in. Uh, so I'll just give it a couple more seconds to let more people vote, and then I'll close the poll and I'll ask our panelists to start to. Um, talk about the results starting with yourself, Devon. Let me close the poll now. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully on the screen, you should be able to see those results. Very interesting. Devon, would you like to leave the commentary? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I really like Megan and Joe's coming in as well. I think this is just a really strong lead into what I'm about to talk about because the two highest um, voted elements, identifying the most vulnerable households early and ensuring residents are claiming all the benefits they're eligible for are really what I'm about to speak to you to speak about next. So um, that wasn't, uh, it's, it's unplanned, so uh, but, but uh, a good result and a nice segue into the next section. Um, Megan, Zoe, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just like say, I, I completely agree, Devin, and I, I would I would also say that these these actually this identification of the most vulnerable um, and ensuring income maximisation does really speak to one of the areas that I think is really important in looking at council tax schemes in that they're not in isolation I and mean, this comes to the hardship fund and the use of any remainder of your council that has that remainder but also your redesign of your council tax scheme to take into account account the post-covid scenario needs to really have a whole authority approach there's no point looking at the council tax scheme in isolation because if people don't have enough money, that has impacts on homelessness, there's impacts on mental health, all sorts of um, ongoing impacts for which the local authority will pick up the cost. So I, I do think this does really speak to that whole authority approach to any redesign of scheme. Great, thanks, Zoe. Uh, Megan, any commentary? Okay, maybe Megan has had an audio issue again. I think we will say um, thank you very much. I shall hide that and then we will move back over to yourself, over to Devon. Thank you, Devon. Uh, thanks, Jen. And if you just move on to the first slide, I'll just start by recapping on um, what Zoe was saying, really, is that, that your hardship fund has to stretch uh, an awful lot, uh, a different amount of stretching for different local authorities. And you can check the hardship fund allocations page to see how your local authority will be affected. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But some of the things that you have to contend with going into the future, I think, I think overall this can be categorized by uncertainty. Um, so we've got uncertainty over the welfare safety net falling away in April 2021. That's what all the legislation says it's going to do. I think there's um, some, some optimism out there that says actually perhaps the government will keep some of these measures in place. But um, as, as uh, Zoe says, from, from kind of conversations and noises from ministers, there's, there's very little grounds for that at the moment. Um, Zoe's already talked about rising unemployment um, and, and using the OBR, OBR estimates. There are other estimates out there. So NISA, the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, saw them um, sort of going up by considerably more. You can see the upper bound for inflation uh, for unemployment here at 6.3 million uh, in the table. Uh, their main assumption is that those that are furloughed 
find it harder to get back to work, whereas I think the OBR make more, more optimistic assumptions around that. So that's kind of what the driver is there. But again, uncertainty is, is a key point. Um, gaps in rent affordability and, and possible evictions uh, in the private rental sector. So gaps in rent affordability, no uncertainty there. We know that's the case. Even with the uplift in, in LHA to the 30th percentile, there's st still many people paying more than that. Um, and still, as we found in our report um, for the GLA that was covered in the Observer last weekend, um, a lot of people, because of those increases in benefits, capped uh, by the benefit cap, which actually means there's still a, there's still a shortfall that they have to make up. Um, and we can we estimate broadly a doubling of capped households um, as a result of 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 those of the increased generosity in effect. Um, uh, a big impact on on children, adults, other, other vulnerable people with with care needs or who are perhaps shielded, uh, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, and the other big thing is changing caseloads. As people we've we've talked previously in past webinars, and you'll all be aware of the, the huge spike in the number of people claiming unemployment benefits still going up, still kind of roughly double um, what the normal trend rate is. Um, and we don't know what rates or what pace at which they're going to return back to work. So being able to keep track of your caseload um, and, and getting, um, I suppose, the modeling that um, Megan talked about would be based on when those caseloads were stable in sort of August, September time. So we'd sort of say, actually, what's your caseload going to be like um, in, in April next year, rather than what was it like in April last year? And making adjustments to that in our modeling for when you're thinking about your council tax support scheme in the future. So I suppose that's the first point is there's huge uncertainty around what you're going to need to um, uh, sort of plan for um, and the support that people are going to need and the number of people that are going to need that support from you. If you move on, Janet. Um, and, and the biggest question I think um, that came out on the, in the poll is, are you sure support is getting to those most in need? So identifying the most vulnerable households is a big challenge. Um, the second the second most important one, according to our poll, um, second only to ensuring residents were claiming all the benefits that they're eligible for. And I think they're right to be concerned about that. So we've done a lot of analysis in this area. We do, we've done a lot of work on discretionary housing payments, which in a sense is the most similar type of discretionary fund, similar to the hardship fund, um, or what, what will be left over from the hardship fund for some local authorities. What we found is that if you apply, for a DHP, you're quite likely to get one. So eight in 10 or nine in 10 DHP applications are paid out. But of those in most in need, only about one in five of those that are identified as being most in need actually apply. Um, and what I wanted to do now, uh, Janet, if you can make me presenter, is talk you through um, how you might identify who the other four and five are um, and, and possibly proactively make a difference to kind of reaching out to those households. Um, are you having any luck there, Janet? If not, we can we can sort of stick with the slides. Because we've got yeah, back up let here. me try and see what I can do. Uh, make you presenter. Great. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Okay, so I wanted to start by just starting with the the story that. Um, Zoe and Megan have just talked through. So starting with this question of council tax hardship fund allocation. If anyone wants to message Janet, the local authority that they're from, you can just go to this web page. Janet will email it out to all those attending. You can enter your local authority here, or you can scroll down to find it. Um, I'm from Loughborough originally, so Charmwood is my area. And I can see here that um, it's been allocated 1.6 million, of which it's going to use up 1.1 million, which will leave 490,000 remaining if it um, pays out 150 pounds to all um, all households who are eligible for that payment. When you factor in the increase in caseload, it's unlikely they'll have a great deal left over. However, if you're in Carlisle or Canterbury, you can see actually they do have some some reasonable sums left over, particularly for the size of the local authority that they are, um, according to our modelling. So this gives you a sense, or a reasonably good sense, from the authorities we've spoken to about how much how much will be left. Um, I'm going to jump from that, assuming no one wants to sort of see their local authority right now, um, Janet, to kind of talking about a particular group that Megan mentioned is emerging as newly vulnerable. So she talked a bit about single people um, who are kind of emerging as newly vulnerable, and some are getting support through their council tax support scheme, but many aren't. And that's one of the reasons why they are vulnerable, is that they've not really been protected through these welfare reforms at all. So if I start here, if you look at these, I've identified here in this coronavirus screen that we developed um, in, in response to the pandemic, there are lots of different groups that you can focus on. But if we focus on this kind of group of single people 
in this case without limited capability who are li living alone you can focus on sort of single people with limited capability for work as well who might be more you might consider as being more in need but actually sometimes this is a group that's often forgotten if i click here um, and drill down to these households you'll see that um, we can start start the process of identifying um, which households are vulnerable and start to set filters. So bringing this 13,000 down to a much more manageable number that you can then do some targeted work with. And, and some of that targeted work might involve um, benefit take up. So if I click into um, here, you can see that I've applied a number of filters on this screen. We've gone down to individual household level. Uh, and we're looking at the households that, in this case, are receiving council tax support and are therefore um, more, more likely to be um, eligible for the, the hardship fund, um, who are of working age, who are private tenants, who aren't currently in work. And I'm going to filter it down to those that are also in council tax arrears. So we've already gone from 13,000 to 955. If I just focus on those in council tax arrears, um, we should see that come down even further to just 40 households. So I've gone from 13,000 to 40 households in the space of about five or six uh, button clicks to, to filter through on a particular cohort. And this is exactly what some authorities are doing. So if I hover over one of these households, I'll show you a bit more about them and talk a bit about the benefit take work. So you can also filter by um, households um, eligible for different types of benefit support. I just click here on benefits take up you'll see that you can filter and carry out take-up campaigns around free school meals, or around childcare, um, or other things. But actually, you can do that on an individual basis. So you can kind of download this list of 40 households. If I click here, um, I can drill down and see even more information about this particular household. So you could actually kind of, one by one, carry out a take-up campaign with these 40 households. You can see in this instance that they've got uh, a monthly shortfall of £81 per month currently. You can look, look back at their history and see actually they had a big shortfall uh, in July 2018. Uh, we can see what happened there. So actually they moved on to universal credit in this instance, which probably left them with a big gap in their income for a period of time. So you can identify those households and say actually perhaps through no fault of their own is one reason why they're currently in arrears um, and therefore should we be able to do more to help them. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side that they're potentially eligible for different types of benefits here. In this case, free NHS prescriptions, warm home discount. Again, single-person households are not eligible to, for as much as perhaps a more complex household would be. But we've seen um, take-up campaigns that have led to significant increases in, in support. And I just wanted to share with you a, a quote from, from one council, um, East Suffolk, that kind of shared some of the work that their community team have done. Um, so I'll just share with you the quote directly. Their community teams, uh, community team has taken a lead on making contact with vulnerable residents identified through Lyft. They're taking the approach of using the filters to really narrow down to small groups of, of households and um, uh, through that, uh, taking up targeted activity. So far, and this is um, an email from a while back, so I'm sure the numbers have gone up, but in, in the first week, the team completed 129 calls from the first cohort, focusing on households with children, the calls were really well received, even if the household didn't require any immediate help. They had a sort of uh, more than a 30% engagement rate, reaching people that required some sort of support or information in the context of COVID or coronavirus. Um, they were helped with uh, increasing benefits, accessing food supplies, food banks, even helped with housing and debt issues. Um, and uh, even in some cases, material to help explain the, the, the pandemic to young children. So if you've got the, I think it's, you know, you've got the staff out there on the ground helping now. It's about making sure those staff are being focused uh, and, and helping those households that are most, most in need. So just to pick up that point, Janet, this now is probably a good point to hand back to you as presenter and just cover off the last couple of slides before we move on to any questions about that. Do post them up if yeah. that's okay. So Janet, can I hand back to you? Yes, thank you, Dylan. Excellent, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Over to you, Devon, for forward-looking analysis from June. Brilliant. Uh, and, and just to say, so from our perspective, this isn't a static situation. So I talked earlier about some, of, and Zoe's already covered some of the key challenges that we're looking to cover. Some of the forward-looking analysis that we'll make available to our uh, list clients from, from June is taking into account housing and homelessness challenges. So looking at um, 
for those in the private rented sector, identifying those that have gaps in rent affordability so they can prepare for the for the when the moratorium on evictions ends and making sure that they're working with those households early now. Again, that's some work that Power Hamlets has been doing uh, proactively currently. Uh, with child and adult services, the impact uh, of the different measures on, on households with children um, or adults with caring responsibilities with older people living within them. Uh, again, um, Harringay took up some, did some take up work on pension credit before the crisis, um, and they recognised, I suppose, that work is even more important now. Um, on employment in the economy, where we've now moved to monthly updates of lifts, so we're getting uh, monthly updates from uh, a number of our lift clients, so we can see the, the change in caseload over time and getting that information to councils much more rapidly than things like um, IMD measures and things which are only updated once a year. Um, and I think the final point is we'll, we'll be modelling different scenarios, so looking in 2021, scenarios for different policy outcomes, so either different council tax support schemes, as Megan was talking about, but also taking into account policy changes. So um, with these measures, with the welfare measures being withdrawn, as is currently set out to be, versus if they if they were to stay in place, again, it's a very fluid environment. So if you so those plants that are using lift are seeing that environment change all the time. Um, and yeah, I suppose just, just to end, probably everyone on this call, including me, is feeling rather a lot like the future is quite uncertain. What we're trying to do is give some certainty or give some bounds for certainty around it so you can see projections um, and start to make sensible decisions around planning for, for demand around council, council support, council services. Um, I think indebtedness is a huge challenge coming out of this. And I think um, as, as you look, as we kind of look to recovery, making sure that um, recovery practices match the current environment, uh, recognizing what the limited options that are open to many people is going to be very important too. So kind of looking at that cohort who have been on benefits for a while versus uh, alongside perhaps a different approach to those that are newly um, newly claiming benefits, are they going to return to work much faster um, or, or, or are they going to uh, get stuck? And if they're getting stuck, what can you do to help them? So identifying that vulnerability, um, households that are now newly vulnerable and what support you can offer them is going to be even more important than ever. Um, so you can get people back to financial independence and, and make sure you're making the most of the of support like the hardship fund that you have available to you. Um, and I think it's been a really rewarding experience um, being a part of, of helping make sure, making sure that that direct support gets to people uh, faster um, because it, that's what people need right now. Um, over to questions, Janet. Great. Thank you ever so much, Devon. And thank you, everybody, for sending in the questions. We've got some interesting ones that I'm going to put um, to our panellists now. So um, I think going back to collection rates, Zoe, so this is probably one for you, if I may. Uh, will councils, do you think that, uh, will councils look to move away from external collection agencies and use it and more to using internal methods? Any thoughts on that, Zoe? Definitely a movement this way, isn't it? I think it, the internal collection allows them to have more control over the process. I think, firstly, when we did a survey of some local authorities around this, um, we saw uh, quite a few who had made this decision. It was mostly, first of all, The performance high. of the external agencies, in fact, the cost did not match. So we were losing you, I'm afraid. Um, and that might not be uh, true of all these other two, but once we interviewed, that was coming across as a clear. Hello. Hi, so the audio is going a bit odd at the moment. So if I move on to another question. Um, I know that your audio will uh, no doubt settle down. Um, how about I ask this question to Megan um, uh, and uh, Devon do come in on this. Um, what, uh, it, what is the back engine uh, used to do the modelling? I know, Me Megan, you touched on that. Uh, and there's a question here asking to expand on that back engine. So we have a policy engine which we use to um, calculate um, a claimant's eligibility for benefits and that's used on the front end in our benefit and budgeting calculator but 
um, it's a really powerful tool which models the entire benefit system. So we've got over 4,000 pieces of legislation from central, local and devolved governments um, all held within this. And um, so that allows us to see um, the eligibility of uh, households across every type of benefit so that we can make tweaks to um, say the council tax support scheme in order to see how a uh, household's overall income and council tax will interact with different types of policy. Um, so um, it gives us a really clear picture of um, down to the household level of the um, policy um, context. Lovely. Thanks, Megan. Hopefully that answers uh, the question there for, for that uh, listener. Um, I have another question here. Uh, from somebody who is asking, um, have councils without 100% CTR schemes got a better collection rate than those that do not? Um, maybe that's not something about collection Sorry, rates and 100% schemes. So we do know that where a household, um, sorry, where a local authority goes from 100% to um, introducing a minimum payment. Um, the effect that that has on arrears is um, almost double. So arrears will be um, twice as, the increase in arrears will be twice as high where that change is introduced from 100% to less than 100% um, as opposed to going from um, perhaps 90 to 80. Um, so yes, moving from 100 to lower is the um, most, um, uh, kind of negative, well, um, negative impact on arrears. So, did you want to come in on that? Uh, no, I think yes, I did. I, but I, um, I think Megan's just said exactly what I was going to say. So, yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, I have a couple of questions here, uh, which I'm hopefully going to do justice to if I if I put them together. Um, but they both around the point that. Um, council tax reduction is one of the most underclaimed benefits and has been for years. Uh, a number of clients who don't claim CTS are all partly due to universal credit, implying it's universal. Um, any thoughts or reflections or advice, uh, perhaps particularly for um, the non-council people who are on the call, uh, about how what practically could be done on that, and, and also your reflections on whether that is true. Um, so, yeah. we'll start with you on that. Yeah, um, can you hear me well now, Janet? I don't Perfect. know what happened yes. there. Yes. yes. So this is really interesting, actually, because we recently did some work with the Welsh Government and we did a major questionnaire of people who claim benefit, not claim benefit, but were entitled. Um, and to try and get to the bottom of why people weren't claiming council tax. But, and there is double the um, the number of people who, who, who didn't feel it applied to them, even if they were on full means tested benefits, doubles under universal credit. The DWP are getting better at pushing people towards claiming council tax support, certainly, but there is still this drop off as people move to universal credit. And one interesting finding we had was 16% who didn't claim, didn't claim because they were scared of the collection practices of their local authority. So they just didn't want to go into arrears, they didn't want to risk the benefits, that the bailiffs, they knew that they probably they might get into arrears. payments so they were just steering clear so that is certainly something to take into account but the biggest the biggest issue is definitely this idea that universal credit is universal um and, and local authorities lose visibility in mean, benefit local authorities could um track those people find out if they will get housing benefit um, that they should be in council tax support and the administration was a dual administration. I think once you've got universal credit and you get the change their scheme to make universal credit um, an automatic application for council tax support so there is no need to backdate and there is no gap. Some local authorities have certainly done that, we know some have, but some are still asking for a separate claim. So um, I think there's a variety of reasons, Janet. Excellent, thank you, Zoe. Uh, and I would Apologies just, um, for those people. Seven. Sorry, Janet, I would just add to that um, and say I think the ambition can also be greater. So from the outset, I think there's been a case for bringing council tax support back into universal credit. The, the biggest challenge there is 
Um, the fact that for that to work, I think capital tax support would have to be fully funded again uh, and go back to 100% nationwide. So, um, but, but given what we're spending to tackle the pandemic, I think it's a small cost to pay for doing something that really, you know, it should have stayed within universal credit in the first place. I think the second point there is, <clears throat> but there is there is a localized approach to that. So we're working with a number of, I know a number of councils that we're working with are calling for universal credit data to be shared with them uh, directly. Uh, currently it's only shared for those that do claim council tax support, but we're saying it should be shared for, for all the universal credit claimants. If that were the case, then there's no, it's, it's perfectly possible for councils to kind of carry out the automated assessment that um, that, that Zoe was just, just talking about. Uh, the ambitious Thank approach is there. Great. Thank you very much, Devon. And thank you, Megan and Zoe as well. Apologies if you've got any kind of echo uh, on those questions from our speakers there. We're all living in, in, a, in a world where we're all demanding the Wi-Fi. So uh, yeah, intermittent sometimes. Um, so thanks for sticking with us. Um, see, so just while we uh, move to the end of the webinar now, um, just to pick up on some of the practical tools that can help with these situations. Um, it's, it's, it's well and good talking about the challenges and solutions and I think tools are very useful. So you will have heard us talk about um, the hardship fund page, which is the second bullet point. Um, and these slides are going and these links are going to be going out to you. So do take a look at that hardship fund page that uh, our speakers talked about today. There's also another page on our website that I'd point you to. Uh, and it is basically your income and coronavirus um, uh, page where we have summarised all of the uh, changes to the welfare system um, from a situation point of view, so if you're a renter, if you've just been furloughed or what have you, and also separately what the actual benefits are, the changes to the benefits if you just want to go straight there. That is kept up to date um, as, as and when announcements are made, so please do take a look at that. Uh, at the end of that page there's over a thousand questions that we have answered uh, from members of the public and organisations um, so, so, and it's searchable as well so I would urge you to take a look at that. Um, as I said there will be a follow-up email with this recording and slides with links on its way to you so uh, do look out for that. When I close this webinar very shortly um, there will be a survey um, to follow and we'd really appreciate your feedback thank you very much and also give you the opportunity to ask for more information uh, and ask further questions of our speakers as well. Um, you will also have the chance to sign up to um, the next webinars. And I'd like to give a special shout out to our partner organisation, Northern, Hous Northern Housing Consortium, who we are doing a webinar with tomorrow. Zoe is speaking uh, on that webinar tomorrow, and Zoe will be going into depth um, on those welfare policy changes that I just mentioned. Um, so, and also joined by speakers from Guinness from uh, Group Kinevin in North Wales and also from the Cura Group as well. Um, so do uh, sign up for that webinar if, if you're interested in your housing association. Our own webinars, we have one in a couple of weeks time looking more about the data analytics that Devon touched on, uh, building that and looking about specifically how we can look to recovery. Um, so do join us on that webinar. And also for those uh, welfare advisors or anybody that's interested, uh, we have a webinar on the 1st of July about surplus earnings and simplifying the complexity of surplus earnings, uh, a challenge if ever there was one. Um, so we'd love to see you on those webinars. Thank you very much. Um, do sign up. So just without further ado, I want to say thank you very much um, to our speakers today. Uh, my colleague um, Zoe Charles with Head of Policy, Megan McLean, Policy and Data Analyst, and Devon Galani, director and founder, all from Policy and Practice. Um, I'm very happy to leave the last word to one of you guys if you want to say thank you and goodbye. Perhaps, Devon? Uh, thank you and goodbye, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure what else there is to say. Um, huge thanks to um, Zoe uh, and Megan as well on the webinar. And just that, that question we got earlier about um, how our engine works, I'd just like to just point out it, it's Megan and the team of analysts we've got here who make sure. Uh, it runs as smoothly as, as it does, and it's as accurate, um, and uh, it kind of does the analysis for each of our, our clients. So while, while we've got here, a huge shout out for the team for doing all of that modelling for both uh, Lyft and uh, Council Tax Report. Brilliant. Thanks, Devon. And thank you, uh, Megan. Thanks to everyone thank for joining us as well. well. Without further ado, I'm ah. going to send you on your way. It's great to have you. Hope to see you again soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.